Hi, I'm Danielle Gagne, Editorial Analyst at Commercial UAV News, and today I'm honored to be joined with Romeo Dersher, Vice President of Public Safety at Arterian. Danielle, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Doing great, and it's great to have you on our program. Um, today we're talking about a really tough topic, uh, the FTC new rules on Made in America. Um, and I'd like to just kind of get started with, you know, how did we get here? And what are some of the concerns in the industry overall about this topic? Yes, so obviously this is a very complex um, topic and it's, it's probably even more complex when you just look at, at the drone industry. Uh, Made in America is not specifically about drones. Um, everything that's manufactured in, in the United States will fall or is falling under this made of America. So it's not specifically uh, on drones, but there are additional items within the drone industry that makes it even more complex. And, you know, in, in today's world, uh, you, you have to be kind of like an economist and a lawyer and, you know, a visionary in one person to really fully understand everything that is happening and, and the impact that it's having on another piece. So um, I'm gonna to try to keep it as, as high level as possible, but we can deep dive into a couple of items. So how, how did we get here? Well, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm in a very unique position. Uh, I spend a lot of time at, at DJI at the market leader in this drones. And, and we started out in the consumer space and moved into the commercial sector. And I saw everything that transpired from that perspective. And today I am a part of Autarian and I'm seeing the world from a very different perspective from the open source and open standards view. And that gives me a very unique um, ability to see how we've gotten here, but obviously the problem one side is these cuts, the commercial off the shelf drones that, you know, in, in 2014, 15, 16, you know, really started to gain momentum. And, you know, suddenly they were used for more than just hobbyist photographers or hobbyist videographers. Suddenly they were really used for life-saving missions for critical infrastructure inspection. And initially they were not meant for these types of applications. Not that they couldn't do them, but they were not built for those types of operations. So the worry is uh, some of these uh, cuts could contain a computer chip that, that is manufactured in a foreign country and you don't know if there is potentially a backdoor on that chip that allows access for, let's say, an intelligence agency or some other nefarious person to get access to that device or to the data on the device. So that's one problem that came about. And then the second piece was, yes, DJI is a Chinese company and there is a, a China cybersecurity law um, of, of 2017, which requires Chinese companies to store data within China. So it can be accessed at will by Chinese authorities. So you have these two components. You have kind of like a, a hardware concern potentially that can lead to potentially somebody gaining access. And you have a data concern um, where your data could potentially go to some entity that you don't want this data to go. So this, these are the two main concerns that kind of started all of this, you know, going back to 2017 when the US Army um, released a memo uh, pretty much outlining that uh, the US Army does a blanket ban on, on these DJI Chinese drones. And from there, we started to see uh, multiple, you know, kind of milestones. Um, I believe in, in May 2019, the US Department of Homeland Security issued an advisory warning um, to US companies against the use of, of these China made drones. Um, just a month later, in June 2019, there was this push for made in America. 
um, which is a, which was a memorandum uh, to the Secretary of Defense that that actually then President Trump signed, citing the Defense Production Act of 1950, and the memo found that. Um, the domestic production capability for small unmanned aerial systems is essential for the national defense. So that's where we started to see that push for, for made in America. And then a few other things happened later that year in 2019, the, the NDAA 2020 uh, section 848 prohibition on operation of pro or procurement of foreign made unmanned um, aircraft systems came out. And so there were all these little things that almost every month something more happened. Uh, uh, the next year in March 2020, the American Security Drone Act of 2020 um, came into uh, play. Uh, then of course, some of the um, drone manufacturers in 2020 started to um, advertise made in America platforms, some more successfully than others. Um, then in, towards the end of 2020, we had the NDAA 2021, uh, where we again had a section 8414 that prohibits operation or procurement of Chinese unmanned aircraft system by the Department of Defense. So it just came like in waves and what happened in the drone industry was that the entire market in essence smelled blood in the water. You know, it, was, it was like this, this market leading entity um, is now you know, kind of bleeding and we, everybody felt like there is an opportunity to swoop in and get some of that market share. And so these, these claims of um, made in USA, uh, made in America, um, you know, were quickly used to, to gain attention of buyers, of especially government entities, but also um, other entities that are not really bound by any of these, you know, NDAA compliant um, suggestions in essence, uh, you know, like commercial entities, but some of these entities, they look very closely what is happening on a government level. And especially when they're working with, you know, critical infrastructure, um, they want to make sure that they go by, you know, whatever the government does and suggests as, as safe. And so here we are, the FTC uh, stepped in and clarified the rule and also put in a mechanism to, to kind of go after these entities that make these claims when in reality they don't meet the criteria to make the made in USA or made in America claim. There is a lot you unpacked there. Um, just the amount of the amount of legislation that's come through in the past couple of years is has really I, I like the way you described it as a wave. Um, and and it, it really is important to note that this really wasn't, you know, aimed at the drone industry. This is so it's it's whatever rules that come out, they're they're going to impact all technologies. In fact, you know, um, Senator Sherrod Brown from he's a Democrat from Ohio. He provided some examples recently um, in an opinion piece about this this you know, ruling. And he says, you know, um, he brings up some examples. Uh, there's a company that that makes hockey pucks and wraps their products in American in American flag and then promotes them as the only American made hockey puck. Um, he talks about uh, a Silicon Valley mattress firm startup that markets the mattress as designed and assembled in the USA. And um, another couple of companies in California that he pointed out that, that market their gear to veterans and service members and put American made tags on the product. But all of these, in all of these cases, they were actually manufactured entirely outside of the United States. And so he brought up these three examples, specifically pointing out to um, items that have come up that are really outside of the drone industry. And I think we've seen that. Now, yes, it is impacting us in the drone industry, and most of us are welcoming this 
because it we believe it brings transparency into all of this. Yeah. And and what do you think kind of prompted? I mean, I think we talked about it a little bit. What, what kind of prompted the U.S. Federal Trade Commission to crack down on Made in America? What were some of the issues? I mean the example of the hockey puck, I mean, if it's made in China versus made in America, that's not going to create a major con security concern. But when you start looking at things like drones and technology, you're really kind of looking at some, some deeper concerns there. What is the impact of, of this on our industry, uh, the, the drone industry? Yeah, so yeah, I, you know, it, it, I have not found any evidence that um, it was specifically looked at because of what was transpiring in the drone industry. And, and, and reality is compared to all the other industries, uh, the drone industry is still very uh, young and still fairly small. So we were not the, 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 the problem child in, I, in all of this, but yes, um, we have seen products that, that uh, were advertised as made in the USA. And if it's a hockey puck, you know, um, I, I wouldn't be as concerned, yes. Um, there, there is kind of like a little bit of fraud behind it because you're purchasing something because you right. believe this, this is made here in the heartland of where I live and therefore I want to buy it. But then when we talk about technology, there could be a whole other set of concerns that come with it. Um, and so for us in the drone industry, I think it's, it's, it's a really good step forward. It brings that needed transparency and that, that needed you know, honesty back in. And it kind of, you know, Danielle, it kind of reminds me going back to, to I believe it was 2000, August 2016 at, at the inner, no, inner drone keynote, I, I made a point to the industry to stop just using unvalidated um, information for, for the purpose of marketing. You know, at the time, um, companies were, were claiming, you know, our drone saves money, our drone saves lives, our drone saves time. And while in theory, yes, that is probably all very true. In 2016, we didn't know as much as today. I, I wanted them to change their thinking, validate your claims, because we are at a point in 2016, we were at a point where you can't just say a drone saves a life because that is a big claim to make. And then when it doesn't happen, then it looks bad, not just on that manufacturer, it looks bad on the entire drone industry. Absolutely. And now in, in, in 2020 and 2021, we're kind of back at it again, that we're making a lot of claims that are not always validated, like the one that, that has gotten us into this position here. So I think uh, this is a very, very good step. And it, it all, it, it, it just opens up transparency to the end users. It really does. And well said, and, and it goes beyond this made in America claim. It's really about validating um, your claims. And so what does this really mean for technology companies already using that made in the USA label? Um, how are they going to navigate these new rules? So the definition hasn't really changed that much. Um, the FTC has, in essence, outlined three different points. So it, it says, okay, final assembly or processing of the product occurs in the United States. Number two, all significant processing that goes into the product occurs in the United States. And three, all or virtually all ingredients or components of the product are made and sourced in the United States. So these are the three you know, definitions that each product has to meet in order to be called made in America. Now, if, if I have a, a product where 50% you know, of all of my components are from you know, Canada and Mexico, and then I just put it together. And up until now, I've been saying, hey, this is made in America. Well, now it doesn't really fit into, right. this, into this definition. So obviously the company now has, or I have to make a decision if, if I was this manufacturer and I have to say either I continue with the claim, but now I run into potentially civil penalties 
that are pretty significant, or I just remove the label and be all honest about what, what my product is and where my product you know, has come from. Now, there is a little bit of a kind of like a gray zone. And that is that the definition of all or virtually all ingredients or components. And that's, you know, that's that law language. And of course, um, if you go into uh, the FTC definition, you find some additional points that kind of explain what all or virtually all means, but it never gives you an exact definition. And that's, in my opinion, the piece that makes it a little bit more, more challenging. So if I have a hundred components to make a product and 99 of those components were made and sourced in the United States, and this one little tiny other component comes from Switzerland, what is it now? Is it, is it virtually all or is it all? I mean, 99% is pretty close yeah. to all or virtually all, but there is no proper definition of that. So that's to me a little bit of a challenge. And in the drone industry, that means, you know, many parts that we use in drones, uh, cameras, uh, gimbals, motors, uh, the airframe, the plastic, and even batteries are manufactured outside of the United States. We, yes, we do have the capabilities to make those here, but for, for most components that I just listed, they are made somewhere else. And that now means if a company really wants to be labeled made in USA, then they have to source those items locally. And that may be challenging um, because, you know, there may not be a, a you know, motor manufacturer in the Uni United States that has the capabilities to, to do 100,000 motors a month or a week. So, and even if, if this company has the capability to produce 100,000 motors for the whole drone market, um, will the price be as competitive as it is now buying it from you know, abroad? So some, some interesting challenges that are coming with all of this, but at the end, it's still a good process to go through because it gives the choice and transparency back to the end user and they know what they're purchasing. And that's a really important distinction, but it also brings up a lot of challenges for the manufacturer, as you pointed out, um, where you get these components and whether or not it's even made in the US, whether the cost is gonna be competitive, what that's gonna to do to your customer base. We can make this in America, but the price is gonna go up X amount of dollars. Um, and, you know, all that impacts the end user as well. It, and America might not be the, best manufacturer for a certain part. It might, the best might be made in another country. And how do you navigate that? How do you make those choices as a manufacturer trying to give the best product to your customer? There's a lot to consider um, as, as we start looking at that Made in America label. Um, so what does all this mean for end users? I think we're kind of hit a little bit on that, especially um, especially for those who are impacted by government policies around country of origin. It, does it have to be made in America to be able to work with a government agency or is made in America just a nice to have? That's a very good question, uh, Danielle. And, and you know, in, in the drone industry, we, we have this additional term that is the NDAA compliant. And the NDA, NDAA is the, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is an annual bill that allows Congress to set guidelines for government policy um, that has often commercial implications. And currently this NDAA restricts the US government, any US government departments from procuring um, those covered UAS. Um, so in essence, vehicles that are manufactured in whole or by, or in part by a covered foreign entity. And so we have NDAA compliant 
and we have made in America. And then we have a third term, and that is the blue SUS line. And now let's, let's take a look at that blue SUS line because that kind of puts things into a little bit of a different line. So the, the blue SUS program um, was developed as a kind of like a, a trusted small unmanned aerial system program. And it, it came out of the Department of Defense and the federal government. And what they did is they set a, a, a few parameters um, and said, okay, um, here are you know, certain specifications that a drone has to meet. And we wanna see which drones can meet those uh, specifications and then we're going to take a look at that and we're going to take we're going to get them into this blue sus program and um they they selected on, on the first round they select, selected five different uh, platforms and those are all small you know small short range reconnaissance a type of drone. So they're, they're on the smaller size, below uh, two kil uh, three kilograms. Um, they, they need to fly 30 minutes plus, um, need to be assembled very quickly in, in two minutes or less, um, have, have a very good payload capability, meaning uh, at least a high resolution day, uh, daylight camera, as well as uh, um, uh, stabilized optics and, and nighttime capabilities. And the architecture needs to be built around an open source protocol, which uh, Altarian came into the picture. But out of those five that got selected, we have FLIR. And FLIR, as we know, is, is, is an American entity. But we have Parrot. And Parrot is not an American entity. And Parrot is, is out of France. And yet they are part of the S, uh, a blue SUS, blue SUS line. And so here you can already see that made in America um, may not immediately mean that you are secure. And made not in America also may not mean that you cannot purchase it. So here's where the complexity starts to come in. So um, to digest this a little bit more, the way I look at it is made in America outlines what it has to be in order to qualify for made in America. NDAA outlines what it cannot be. So it cannot be from a foreign entity that is on, on a certain list or components uh, like, like you know, uh, the, 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 the flight controller, for example. Right. Um, so it, it, it outlines what it cannot be. And then you have the blue SUS line that is kind of a, a mix. It's, it is potentially made in the USA. It is certainly NDAA compliant because Parrot is not France is not on that list that the NDAA compliance uh, list shows as you know we cannot have any of those components. So this is kind of like where it all meets. So it, it, it's it's very fascinating and and uh, it, it gets really really complex if you if you really start to dig into it. I can see that and. It's, it's, but it's really important to, for, for people who are end users to realize that made in America doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, if it's not made in America, it doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't secure. And, and that's a really important thing to consider is that it is a complex conversation and it's not just about that one um, label that we need to be considering. Um, and it kind of goes into that that conversation of like this is all really confusing for people, and that we all just kind of want a clear way to obtain a secure drone. Um, the FTC is taking has taken those additional steps to clarify this labeling process, and that's definitely a move in the right direction. It does provide transparency for end users and everyone in the industry. But is having that label really the be all and end all of security? Um, and should people be aware of things beyond that country of origin? 
Yeah, so I think one thing is clear. Um, Made in America doesn't immediately address the security questions and concerns. So we can have all the components made in, in America, but it that alone doesn't just give you a, a stamp of approval that this is the most secure piece of technology because there can, there can still be potentially software on it that is, uh, you know, that has uh, back doors, for example. Um, so that's number one. But then we also have to look from an end user perspective. So we have, in essence, we have three buckets of end users. We have the government entities. So that's your, your federal government departments. And, and let's not look at the, on the defense side. Let's just look at you know maybe an FBI or uh, NTSB that uses drones for aircraft accident uh, reconstruction purposes. Um, then the bucket two is you know, kind of like your, your public safety. It's like more like your local government and you know commercial entities that work with critical infrastructure and then your third bucket is pretty much you know everybody else like your your, your everyday farmer and your wedding photographer um, they all have somewhat of different levels of needs when it comes to secure um, the, the the wedding photographer um, he or she may may really not care if um, flight data gets shared somewhere or seen by someone. So their level of concern is probably the very lowest. And then you have that second bucket. You have that that kind of local government, um, commercial entities that um, are working on critical infrastructure, and they look at that first bucket. They look at what is the federal government doing? And whatever the federal government you know, says and recommends, that's probably what we want to adopt as well. So we're safe, potentially because we may get federal funding. If you're a local, you know, fire department, then you may get a federal grant. And now you kind of are bound by what's happening with that first bucket. But the commercial entities, they're kind of detached from the federal level. They're not bound by what an NDAA says. However, they want to ensure that they operate at a safety standard and level that meets the federal government requirements. And so they're very interested and they're looking at that first bucket. So when, when the NDAA uh, compliance came out, which is really not a law, it's, it's, it's more like a, a recommendation and of course, there's some other items in it, like a, a risk assessment that has to be presented to the president, the president then has to review. Um, but if that were to come into a law, then the NDA compliance is the best way um, to secure that you have the most proper secure product versus if you're just focusing on made in America. Made in America may may meet the requirements of the second bucket, certainly meets the requirements of the first bucket of the wedding photographer, you know, that the wedding photographer may want to support an American business, um, but that's, that, that's about it. So right. I would really focus on uh, products that are NDAA compliant, because that is right now, pretty much the highest standard of, 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 of safety in essence. Absolutely. That's, thank you for kind of clarifying all that confusion that's going with that. Um, just to kind of boil this down, what in your opinion should agencies like public safety and emergency response be looking for when ultimately answering that question, is my drone secure? Is it just that NDAA compliant or is there some other things that they should be kind of looking for? Well, first of all, let's, let's be very clear that technology is nothing new to public safety and connected devices that you know have a connection to 4G, LT, 5G, the, the internet, that's been it's been in use in public safety for for a long time, and they have 
data processes in place to secure you know that 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 data stays where it needs to be and that it's safe so um i don't think that that is uh, the, the question now if if a department gets federal funding to acquire additional drones or or components or robotics then the set of guidelines you know determine what they can purchase so it's kind of a flow down requirement so on a federal level federal money comes trickles down it comes also with the with the limitations in essence of what the, that money can be used for um, if the entity if the public safety entity gets um, you know donation and a lot of departments are getting donations to get started and their drone programs then they have choices they can utilize this money in in what works best for their needs yet still meets the criteria they already have established as a department on data security and and all the processes but that doesn't mean that they then have to go and and buy um, this, the same way as they would if it was federal money. So they have a little bit more flexibility. But at the end of the at, at the end of the day, um, they should look for NDAA compliant products because then they they know for sure that whatever they're getting is meeting the highest standard or bar or expectation. Um, obviously, second would be, you know, made in America. But then, you know, you still have products that are made outside of the United States that are highly recognized here in the United States that are even in, in a program like the Blue SUS uh, program. So, again, there is just no, no one way to say do this and you will check all the boxes. Right. So we have to think that country of origin and all these security questions are an, an American concern, but this isn't really just the case. Many countries are really trying to sort this out and have secure technology and how to figure out how to do that in a global marketplace where we're making components everywhere. And sometimes the best component isn't ideally where you'd like it to be. Being an international company, how are you seeing these conversations play out in the global market? Did it and did it play a part in figuring out your most recent announcement with uh, NTTE drone in Japan? Um, how do their concerns kind of impact the types of applications you'll be focusing on there? Oh, that's a that's a really good question, Danielle. Um, I personally see this as a as a global movement, in essence, from open. Um, or from closed to open in the drone industry. And it's, it's truly spreading across. It's not just in North America or in Switzerland. It's really something that is now becoming a global phenomenon that, that we wanna go from a closed environment to, to an open source, open standards environment where we have more transparency, where we have more community involvement where not one entity is making a decision where it's really the combination of a lot that contribute and, and also review each other and, and look at what's being done and how can it be improved. And this is not something, you know, earth shattering new. Um, we've already seen and experienced, experienced the success with open source in the computer industry. Uh, Linux and, and Red Hat are two very, very great examples. And kind of also in, in the smartphone industry with, with Android, where we, we have an open operating system that functions on multiple platforms. So this, this whole open versus closed decision um, is, is something that companies around the globe are not only reviewing, but starting to get behind it. And they're joining these movements um, because they're seeing the benefits and the benefits are absolutely outweighing the status quo that is today. And so uh, we, we wanted to partner with NTT uh, eDrone in Japan because uh, NTT is, is one of the largest telecom companies in the world. And 
they have a very forward thinking vision. They, they, they want to utilize drones more for not only their own critical infrastructure inspections of cell towers, for example, or, or you know, uh, cables that go under bridges and so on, um, but they want to they want to really focus on a more robotics integrated future where many dangerous jobs um, can be supported with all kinds of different robotics, not just drones, but in order for all of this to work properly together, they want to see this integrated into you know, their network. And it makes a lot of sense because um, we've talked about this in the past, we've come to the point in the drone industry where you know, hardware will continue to improve. Uh, companies will continue to make amazing payloads, fantastic drones that, that will fly longer and further and do more things. That's not the question. But we have come to the point where the data is that really important piece. And in order for, for that data to properly propagate into the workflows and through the workflows, we need connectivity. We need drones or robotics that are connected, that can send that data straight to where it needs to go or straight where it can get processed. And so it's, it's almost a logical move, in my opinion, that a telecom company says, you know what, um, you know, for, for, you know, decades, we have provided telephone line service, actual lines where you, you had this phone at home that you had to connect to a plug in the wall. And that was provided, that connectivity was provided by the telecom company. And then they moved into the digital age where um, they're, they're giving us that line in form of a SIM card that goes through the air and connects to the tower and gives us that connectivity. And now they see the next evolution of where these telecoms can come in. And that is in providing more bandwidth for data transfer and not only one way, but two ways. So you can you know, control your robotics device through over the network, the same network that you potentially also then get all the video and data pieces back. And suddenly we're looking at a future that, that is tremendous because we can do so many more applications with this technology. Um, it's gonna create new jobs, yes. It will also uh, potentially eliminate some jobs, mostly the jobs that are pretty dangerous that we now can um, you know, enhance with robotics, make those those jobs more safe, but on the back end, we need additional individuals um, with a different skill set to do certain um, pieces. So uh, it, it's, it's an evolution. And I think that is really what we're seeing right now in the drone industry that we have, we have started to move away from this one operator, one drone concept don't get me wrong, this will continue to be a way to deploy drones for, for a long time. And in many cases, um, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm gonna go back to the wedding photographer. Um, she is bringing her drone to the wedding and flying it from there. She's not gonna sit at her home um, launching that drone, you know, hundred miles away just to get those, those uh, aerial photographies of, of the couple. Maybe that's gonna happen in the future, but that's very unlikely. We're talking about that, that you know, next generation, uh, that power line inspection, that cell phone line inspection, where you know, we, we can do miles and miles and miles of inspection from afar um, because we have the connectivity, we have the framework, we have the legal requirements. And that is thinking ahead. It's now, now is the time to think you know, these five, 10 years ahead and set the corner pieces so that we can build all of that. And that's exactly what's happening with NTT eDrone in Japan, um, mostly because they, they want to find, they want to join this, this movement to open source, open standards, give me choices, give me many multiple manufacturers, multi-payload manufacturers, let me build my fleet, let me have one user interface 
and let me have connected pieces. And that's amazing. And, and you, you start to see how that becomes an internet of things, of, of interconnected devices that can communicate with each other and, and do a job and take away some of those dangerous positions that really put people at risk. And, um, you know, and that really kind of ties into, I'd imagine all, all these questions about, you know, where is that piece made? Is it, is it secure? All of those things have to go into that kind of decision making so that you know that everything that's working in this connected environment is not going to be hacked as well. It, would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're becoming so much more connected and more and more devices are joining this network. And yes, uh, security and safety is, is imperative in, in this process for us to continue to be successful. And, you know, if we look at the internet at, the, at an early stage when it was developed to what it is today, a tremendous change, not only in everything that can be done, but also in levels of security that have been built in that constantly are getting, you know, breached by groups that find the weak spots to, to get access to information, hold information hostage or entire systems hostage. Clearly, um, there is always going to be a small percentage of individuals that are trying to find the weak points to do something that, you know, doesn't help the greater community, but gets them some advantages. And we will, con we, we, we just have to work on this as a community. And that's, again, that's why I'm going back to this, this open source thinking, because we cannot have one entity say, this is how it needs to be done. This will not work in the long run. This has to be a collection um, of, of voices of the community that that sets those standards that that checks each other because otherwise we're going we're getting ourselves into potentially very dangerous territory if we have single entities that dictate how things need to be done it's true um the, and the more minds that are are tackling this this issue it, it, the more you're going to be able to see those vulnerabilities and also anticipate any changes in in how people are exploiting um, these types of, of systems um finally uh my last question for you today it's kind of hard one um how do we ultimately strike that balance that we're that we're talking about you know you have the global markets everything's being made internationally there but we also have to deal with the political boundaries that that are setting laws and regulations about who and where we can get our products from and and this drive for technological innovation idea, um, ideas new technologies that are propping up internationally and and can we get where we want to go by just sticking to these country borders or is this going to have to be a bigger negotiation and to move forward you know I'm, I'm i'm only a vice president of public safety and this is such a big topic that that touches so many aspects of everyday life and geopolitics and and laws and and cultural thinkings um in my my opinion geopolitics have and will continue to play a big role in, in today's and in the future world. Um, just look at what's, what's happening in Europe right now with the European Union and the UK leaving the European Union. Um, this, this has changed yet again, this alliance and um, things are now having to be rethought again because one of the member goes out of this alliance, of this union. And it just shows how complex all of this is. Now, adding to the fact that technology moves so fast, much, much faster than governing laws. Um, and we have entered an area where big technology and software questions have really come uh, to the forefront that we have to address, that we have to think about. 
um, we've come to the point where we have to make some really important decisions for the future, especially around topics like AI. Um, again, like what, what I mentioned before, um, should this be a single entity, a, a government that, that lays out the laws around AI, or should this be potentially a community approach where we, we bring the concept of open source, open thinking together for more transparency and for a more spread out approach and kind of democratizing the decision-making. And I think that is going to be key. Um, we have to focus on an ecosystem and that ecosystem is and needs to be across borders um, because that's good for innovation. That's, that's good for understanding certain problems that we may face in the United States um, others are not facing or other areas around the globe have different problems that we in the United States don't properly understand. But by working together, we can bring those sides together and find solutions that work for both. And, and you know, capabilities are different uh, across borders. So in, in, in my, you know, small little view of the world, there has to be an ecosystem there has to be partnerships but there also have to be um, very cautious approaches and guidelines and potentially laws um, that help us along uh, because certain countries may have very different motivation uh, or motivations to do certain things and if those motivations are in direct um, contact or in, 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 in direct, um, you know, our beliefs, then we got to take that into consideration. And that is really the job of, in this case, you know, the US federal government, um, but it could also be much more global. It could be also that, you know, the, the, the United Nations are, is going to look at some of these questions and, and bring in uh, the right, entities to, to, to lay out the framework so that we can continue to be innovative and innovative across borders and, and bring the technology to the people so it makes the biggest impact with the least amount of concerns. But do I have all the answers to this? Absolutely not. Um, it's much more complex than uh, what we've discussed over the last you know, 50 plus minutes already. These are fascinating times that we're in, and we have an opportunity to shape this technology, this industry, and what is being done with the technology in the future. And that is something that we should not take lightly, but we can be extremely proud of. So to me, it's very exciting. For me as well, um, we're really in, in the nascent stages of, of determining all of the, this, these amazing things that are going to go and, and impact the future of this industry and, and technology uh, in the future. And all I can imagine is that we can't foresee where technology will take us. And so whatever we do today just needs to have that openness and, and that flexibility and adaptability to, to not get us mired in, in any of this kind of um, if, if the rules no longer work two years from now, we're gonna to have to keep on reinventing everything. So whatever, we, whatever we're thinking about today, it needs to have that democratization as you, as you mentioned and have the voices of as many people as possible to be adaptable to wherever the technology has to take us. Thank you, um, Romeo, for, for joining me today and for such an informative conversation. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot to to digest. It's a lot to think about. But I think you 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 nailed it. With this is not something that we decide today and then it's done for the rest of our lives. This is going to be a continued conversation, a continued thinking process that has to involve more than just one person, one entity, one government. Absolutely.